my own eclectic nature, the idea that the wind blows with her will, so Michael goes. <laughs> you know, every time there's a windstorm, Michael's going somewhere else. You know, the wind blows with her will. You neither know where it's coming from nor where it's going. So too, there's one by the Spirit of God. That's been my motto. <laughs> if you want to know where I've been, wherever the wind's gone, I go. <laughs> and that's happened quite a bit in my life. But in Bible school, we really wanted to slow down and take the time to you know, remind you that this is beginning with Christ, that it's Navigator Press, you can get a free one, there's five scriptures in it, and that it's probably the most powerful, one of the best tools that I've seen in order to get someone quickly grounded in something that's going to keep them occupied for the rest of their life. As a matter of fact, my wife, you know, Lori, God bless her, she's a blonde, so she's on number one and will stay there for the rest of her life. <laughs> You know what number one is? I changed the order here because you know I didn't agree with you know the order they were going in, and I said, well, me personally, I said I understand that they're doing this for assurances, you know, but I don't like the word assurances because I can't find assurances in scripture. So I like to just go ahead and use the scripture itself in order to define what it is, so that way we know what we're talking about. And number one was trust in the Lord with all thy heart. <laughs> it's like. Okay, we just wiped out everybody in the entire universe because nobody trusts in the Lord with all their heart. Everyone leans in their own understanding. No one acknowledges Him in all their ways. And God knows if He's directing our paths, we're doing a pretty bad job of it. <laughs> so, I've always said that if you want to sum up the Bible in one scripture, use Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. And that's what we were doing in number one, as we were talking about the basic believers class and basic believers of five scriptures that you should use once someone gets saved, however they get saved, you know, call upon the name of the Lord, shall we say, you know, there's so many things that people invent in Christianity in order to confirm to someone or affirm to someone that they are who they say they are and doing what they say they're doing in order to do what they want to do to get done what it is that God's going to do anyways. You get that? In other words, when people get saved nowadays, they have this big rigmarole, you know, kind of like, well, you got to make sure that you profess with your mouth and confess your sin and acknowledge that you're, you need him and acknowledge that he's coming in your heart and that he died on the cross for your sins and that all these things have been done for you and now you got to accept it and believe it and do it and receive it and act and acknowledge it and, you know, yada, yada, yada. I didn't have a clue what the heck all that was. <laughs> Man, I was, call me blonde, you know, I mean, I was an idiot. You know, so I just kind of, you yeah, know, you don't want to get saved, you know. And I kind of went forward, you know, and they laid hands on me. They didn't make me do all this stuff, you know. And he said, you want to know Jesus? I said, or you want to accept Jesus? I said, yeah. So they said, well, let's pray. And I, they had hands on me on both sides, and I knelt my head and prayed, and I don't remember what I prayed, because I don't think it was a sinner's prayer, but it must have been, because that's what everybody seems to do. And so, man, I was like, whoosh, whoosh, like a light bulb lit up. And uh, <laughs> God only knows what those two guys prayed, but, you know, one of them was from, you know, Calvary Riverside, so, you know, hey, it was Greg's church, so must have been right. <laughs> Be careful. Now, we look at the real background of Christianity and we see that no there isn't always been this sinner's prayer that you know people get saved with people that come to Jesus come to him as they are how that process begins and when it begins is between the Lord and his Holy Spirit because it's the love of God that draws men to repentance and when a person decides to choose to follow God we don't honestly know an exact day or date we make that declaration based upon some action that a person takes, but the real truth is God was working on me a long time ahead of that. You know, I already know that. And if he wrote his, our names down in the book of life long before we were even born, then, you know, you just kind of got signed, sealed, and delivered on the day that you think you got saved. So if you got saved and you don't think that you had the right formula, don't worry about it. We'll take care of it. <laughs> just in the meantime, do Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart, and not in thine own understanding, and all thy ways acknowledge him, and he'll direct thy path. And we showed you how, like in the first song, the first proverb, you should, you know, sit down with somebody and repeat it back and forth and play a game with it. You know, don't get so serious. You know, don't be too carried away. Take one scripture per week, you know, just kind of let them read it, understand it, apply it, you know, explain it to them to say, who do you trust? You know, do you trust in the Lord? Do you trust, you know, 
and make them answer according to the scripture because that's always best. Answer scripture with scripture. Who do you trust? Trust in the Lord. So you, who do you trust? You trust in the Lord. That's always the answer. See what I'm saying? So those are the parts that you do and that's what we're going to do in number two. It's funny how that rhymes. You think I'm wound up on caffeine or an energy drink? Not! If I had caffeine or an energy drink, I'd be wound. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be talking about a minute. But you see, I was a network engineer, so I can revert back into talking a mile a minute twice as fast as those guys that are on energy drinks. And I might outlast them. Oh well. So since we're not going in order, and we've already kind of tossed out you know, the framework, but I did tell you to get this. You know, It's kind of a, called the Beginning with Christ series, and it's kind of a good idea to just look through it and see if you want to do it, because howsoever the Lord leads you, that you should do, and whatever the Holy Spirit is teaching you, that's the way that you should teach. So, in explaining it, instead of calling it assurances, we're going to go right into the one that I think is the biggest priority right after trust in the Lord. And that is, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the one we're going to discuss today. If we confess. Now, that's a big if. Because, <laughs> frankly, I don't know too many people that are willing to confess their sins. <laughs> and not me, man. <laughs> I didn't do it. Nope. It was Eve. She did it. Eve did it. It was that woman you gave me. The woman you gave me. What's the matter with you, God? Don't you know any better? I was doing fine with that dog. That dog and I, we were we were hitting it off, you know. Then you gave me her, and look what happened. Man, it's a mess. If we confess our sins. <laughs> Which, obviously, Adam didn't, and that's why we're here today. <laughs> okay, put the woman in charge next time. Yeah, right. <laughs> we'll see how well this goes. So... In confessing our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. You see, if we confess them. But to forgive our sins, part of that says if we confess it. So you see, there's kind of like a reverse priority here. You know, kind of like, did God accomplish the work of remittance of sin by dying on the cross? In other words, taking away the stain of sin? Taking away the, the pain of sin? Taking away the consequence of sin? Well, yeah. But acknowledging it in life is something that we are required to do by God in order to have that applicable means of his salvation working in us to accomplish being set apart so we don't sin anymore or less sin than what we did before because if we continue on in sin we're going to hell <laughs> in a hand basket but if we're growing in grace and learning to not sin as much as we used to, which is what God's purpose is, he's going to be doing that in us, then as we confess our sins, he's able to do it more effectively. You see, because part of us, our fleshy, sinful part, kind of messes everything up unless we confess it. So you see, there's this kind of like little sneaky thing over here that's called your mind that says, you know, I have the mind of the world. It says, well, since Jesus died for my sins, I don't need to confess it. I don't need to actually say it. I can just do it, you know, and go on. You know, that I don't have to confess because, you know, that's just stupid if Jesus already died for my sins. <laughs> Wrong choice. The right answer is if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It doesn't reduce or cause reduction in the accomplishing work of what Jesus has done on the cross it does reduce and cause accomplishment in our flesh which is warring against our spirit to cause us to not be changed from glory to glory into the image of the incorruptible God because we are still harboring sin in our mind because our conscience if it be guilty and it condemn us then greater is he that is in us in our conscience but at the same time it hinders the work of the spirit that's in us and that work of the spirit needs to be accomplished that he would present us faultless before the Father with exceeding joy and looking out at the whole story, you just figure out, well, God's doing it, but he wants me to do my part. So that's the way to put it simply. you got to do your part. So when you want to grow in grace, you want to grow as a baby Christian, or you want to grow as a Christian at all, then you need the first one, trust in the Lord with all my heart, and you can go back to the video and see it. And then the second one, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So getting into it, what we're doing is we're getting people to actually answer. Remember we were going to say how you could sit down and do this? You just have two of these, you walk around, you got it in your pocket, you know, and you pull them out and you go, hey, have you studied the next one in the series we were going to do? Remember we were, we were talking about, you know, growing as a Christian, you know, beginning with Jesus, you know, and by the way, 
shameless plug. Oh, how I do an aside. Shameless plug that I want to put in for selling you a book. I don't sell books, but we're going to make one called Beginning of Jesus because I think that I would like to do one of these a little better. So call me crazy, but a long, long time ago in a faraway land called Klamath Falls, before there was any Calvaries or any type of fundamentalist Christians, because technically there wasn't a vineyard, there wasn't a contemporary Christian to be seen. But I was there. <laughs> and there was a church that was kind of dynamic at the time. It was kind of like really moving in the spirit in some ways. And it was called People's Community Church. And they had this really cool little discipleship book, you know, that the pastor went through. And man, I, when I was going through it, I was like, hey, this is pretty cool. You know, I, I want to use this. I'm going to, you know, revise it because the pastor has some kind of like, from a denominational point of view, you know, he has a certain perspective. But for me, it was like, man, this is really a good idea. So we're going to present one. I'll write it, I'll get it, put it out there for you, you can have it free, you know, PDF it and then print it and you run around teaching everybody everything they ever needed to know in a short lesson because after all, I'm married to a blonde. I gotta make it simple. Keep it simple, silly. Or was that stupid? Well, you know. So, getting back to it, as you would be carrying one of these, you just pull it out and you say, hey, you know, here's a table, here's lunch, let's eat. <laughs> and then you go through it. Now, me personally, I like to bring people to eating because they'll keep their mouth shut, you know, usually while you're talking. And then while you're talking, you know, or you're trying to interrupt, you're busy with food in your mouth so you don't interrupt them. It kind of works out pretty good that way. It's called a Jewish kind of mindset, you know. You kind of think of these things, you know. <laughs> it works pretty good, you know, because as soon as, you know, like in a normal, like, Shabbat setting, if you were going to do something crazy like that and interrupt somebody, somebody would pass you another glass of wine. <laughs> another wine? Wow, well, okay, well, you know. Oneg Shalai. Oneg. That's joy. But the point is, is that in sitting down and eating, you get a chance to fellowship and to talk to each other. And that's what you should be doing, relating. You're actually binding yourself together in the spiritual realm, that you're becoming one in the Spirit and one in the Lord. Where two or more are gathered, there I am in the midst, Jesus says. So when you get together with a new believer, especially, they're going to rub off on you because you're probably cynical and gotten all bitter and better and think that you're righteous. And you actually find out that that little born-again Christian that just got saved is probably closer to God than you are. I want some of what they got. I want that little new wine, you know, that they got. Because it might be better than my old wine. So enjoy it. Have fun with it. Believe it. And do it. And so you'll be going into the number two. So when you take the number two, you always, as we said in number one, look at the scripture that you're reading. Because when you make that eye contact, that visual identification of the process with which a person is learning, then what you're doing is you're actually giving them an example to follow so that when they see you, they see you looking at the word and they realize subliminally that they should be looking at the word too. So instead of looking at you as being the teacher, they're looking at the word as the word teaching them by way of the Holy Spirit inspiring them. So you see how that works? Yeah, you got it. No problem. Just remember, don't look at what they're wearing. Don't comment on some stupid thing, you know, about you got to have some, you know, visual technique of talking about how wonderful they are and how, you know, you want to reinforce them in some worldly wisdom, you know, trying to mix in, you know, the world's ways with, you know, the, the inspirational speaking engagement kind of Toastmasters thing, you know, and trying to apply it to your your newfound liberty to be in Christ, and now you're going to be a disciple, or you know, a disciple, or you're going to be this mega pastor, you know. And you got to make sure that you got your suit on, and you're doing all these super natural weirdo blech, throw up things, you know, in order to convince someone that just a poor Christian wants to get saved. The poor person just wants to know the truth and wants to be set free, and they want to know Jesus. And by golly, you've gotten all carried away and trying to be religious and trying to be holy and trying to be something you're not. So don't be what you're not. I mean, if you're holy, okay, then put on your robes, you know, and go do your thing, you know. And if God's brought you somebody to teach this with, be holy to them. <laughs> if you're righteous, then by golly, turn on the organ and teach them. Dun, 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 dun. Or, you know, if you're just you, be you. You know, I mean, if it's your normal thing to... You know, go out and have coffee at Starbucks, and hey, take them to Starbucks, you know. But you take them, not they take you. Not they pay, because, you know, that's not right. But you take them, and you go with the Lord, and the Holy Spirit will inspire you with the words that you need to share with them at the time. 
don't make it all into some big deal because if you do then you're going to confuse yourself but be as natural as you would be talking about the soap operas or the news or what the baby was wearing when it was born or how many pounds it was because you know if you're a woman you know all that stuff I mean I don't know I think all babies are ugly when they're born they look like old men <laughs> You know, or they look like drowned rats. One of the two, they go from a drowned rat to an old man. And then finally, once they're about a year old, they start looking like something decent, you know. <laughs> they finally get some hair, some features, you know. And then I start going, yeah, okay, I got you. Yeah, that's kind of a cute kid. You know, can't wait till they grow up, you know, talk to them. <laughs> He's bad-mouthing my baby. <laughs> Oi, <laughs> well, at least I'm me. <laughs> You'll never find another me. Maybe someone like me, but not me. And that's what you need to be. You need to be you. Because God made you unique and distinctive and different, and he wants you to relate that unique and distinctive difference to that other person so that they can be who they are. Don't try to make yourself into a cookie cutter, and you're going to make this person into what you are. God doesn't work that way. He uses the basics of what he wants to do to make his own dough, and then he raises it up the way he chooses, whether it be a loaf of bread, or just a simply cookie, you know, like kind of what you are, you know, chip off the old dough, so to speak. So when you do that, then just be sure to take your little book out, you know, and if you keep the extra one like I told you to last week or last time that we got together in the video, then you always keep two just in case, and you've got the extra one in case you find somebody to get saved. <laughs> or they forget theirs. <laughs> they forget theirs, pull it out. They don't cost nothing. This one costs, well, too much. But, you know, you can get some free on the Internet. Those are 20. Are you crazy? I wouldn't pay that. Thank God I didn't. Got it at a youth store. So when you get into it, you know, number two, as we said, is, and I know that a lot of people like to use addresses. I don't. I think it's stupid. We invented it. We made it up. But some people like to do that. So you could either flip open a Bible and show them or just read it from here. I would read it from the booklet so that way they're focusing in on it. But you go into... If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. He is faithful and just and will for... Got to pick the version I like. One side is King James. <laughs> and if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so you work with him. First John 1, 9, by the way. It's in First John. Almost everything's in First John, unless it's in First Corinthians and John. So out of five, that's not bad. Sort of. <laughs> Okay, maybe not. Anyways, in, in confessing our sins, you want to, first of all, get the person that memorizes it to practice it with you, to see if they've got it memorized. If they do, great. If they don't, then you work it through, and the steps of memorization are simple. You work it like a song. The way you remember a song is the way that you sing along. Because if you repeat it three times, you will seek it. And then you'll go along and sing it like a lot. You know, whatever. <laughs> Just rapping. I don't know. I'm making it up as I go. So, if you take it in parts. Do it in measures of beat, music. And some of you that sing already know what I'm talking about. But you don't have to, you know, do it in some rap way. You can just go, if we confess our sins, 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 yeah, if we confess our sins, yeah, if we confess our sins, hey, if we confess our sins, yeah, if we confess our sins, hey. You see, you can have fun with it. Because as you start to play with it, you can use any rhythm you want and beat. Or you could just use what I did, which was just a typical, what used to be called camp meeting rhythmic um, memorization tool. That's an idea of where you just do it as a marching song. If we confess our sins, hey, if we confess our sins. In other words, they teach you this in the military, then they teach you this in all these kinds of schools for thought, and they teach you this in memorization tricks, and they teach you this in all kinds of weird old ideas and all these different ways of trying to say, we got rhythm. <laughs> we got rhythm. We got my girl. We got scripture. Who can talk about anything else? But the point is, is that rhythm does work, and that is probably true that when you get to heaven, you're going to hear everything instead of spoken sung. But that's just an opinion. It's not necessarily true. So as you begin to memorize it and practice it, you can do that, and we'll do it seven times like we said before. And to show you that you always do what you say to tell someone else to do, we're going to go through it right now seven times. So you can tune this out if you want to. If we confess our sins, 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 
If we contest our sins, if we contest our sins, if we contest our sins, hey, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. If we contest our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. If we contest our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. If we contest our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Hey, see, seven times. Is there more? I don't know. Did I forget some? Oh! If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Dude, it's it. You got it. So you see, playing with it, giving it the opportunity to become real in a person's life, joking about it, laughing about it, then it becomes something that's fun to do rather than something boring where you're going, I don't think I can memorize the long ones. It's kind of confusing. Well, I don't like to mix numbers with words, so that's why I don't put numbers in it because Proverbs 3, 5, 6 and 1 John 4, I was seven and eight and all that stuff. And I, when I first studied it, you know, at a home pastor's Bible class, you know, then yeah, I memorized the numbers. And then I studied it later and realized, forget that. <laughs> I said, I ain't doing that, man. That's stupid. You know, well, you know, okay. For some people, it works, you know. So if you want to add the numbers, you can work it into your own rhythm. <laughs> but I won't. So when you're doing that, once you've completed that and you go, yeah, good job, then you buy dessert. Because <laughs> they're going to need sugar after that. <laughs> Speaking of sugar, I got coffee with cream and sugar. Give me a minute so I can wind up again. Man, I got to cut down on the sugar and the cream. Maybe the coffee too. Ain't gonna happen. It's either that or Pepsi, and I do both. So, the next step that you would do in this, as we mentioned in the first one, was that you would begin to ask questions back and forth so that you practice with each other so that way the person who you're sharing, teaching, relating this material to would also learn how to share, relate, and teach that material to. So that way you've made a disciple as quickly as you have taught them how to move on and understand what if we confess our sins, faithful just for sins comes from all righteousness just means and why they should do it every day of their life because they're going to sin every day of their life and they're going to fall down. Seven times and as Peter said, how many times if my brother comes to me and asks for forgiveness, should I forgive him? He says seven times. He says no. Seventy times seven. So you could probably count on sinning about 490 times a day. But if you don't keep track, that 491 will get you right sent to hell. <laughs> no, it won't. Maybe. You know, that 490 is significant because there are 490 years that were rendered unto the children of Israel that they were put into bondage, you know, into, well, bondage. They were sent off into Babylon because of all the, time, all the sins that they committed. So if 490 was the time that needed for judgment to come and that they were actually released from Babylon back into Israel, then 490 might be significant. But frankly, I don't think that you could go out and sin 490 times. Maybe you could. Maybe you're an expert at it. Maybe you're a master of disaster, you know, and you really are good at that kind of, you know, occasion. But I don't think that you would come back to your brother and ask him 490 times for forgiveness. Because if you sin against one person 490 times, they'd kill you. <laughs> About the third time, bam, man, you're you're done, you know, dude. You got like six more times, and then I hit ten, and that's it. I'm wiping you out because you're just you know stumbling yourself. <laughs> 490 ain't gonna cut it. So, anyways, as you learn to share that, you can add your wisdom that you've learned along the way with your personal life experiences. So, in discussing it, the first thing you say is, if we confess. So, what is it that we should confess? 
And the answer is always our sins. You don't say, well, we should confess what we've done that day. That's not the answer. You see, the answer is the scripture. Because you're trying to reiterate the point of scripture answers scripture in context of scripture. I call that item specific. In other words, the item itself specifies itself what itself is for. Item specific. It's called IS... Um, Ex, well, IS methodology of studying the scriptures, item specific, where it is, what it is, the way it is, as it is. And that's what I've come up with and pretty much wrote a doctorate on. And probably one day you'll get, you know, a master's for it from some other THD, PhD, if I decided to go for it. <laughs> but no, I'm not. I just decided that, you know, I said, well, you know, I've looked at exegesical, I've looked at the way they do this, you know, as far as the pragmatic, you know, as far as the allegorical, as far as the symmetry, and all these other 13 or 14 or 20 different ways that theology school teaches of how to interpret scripture or how to apply scripture or how to read the scriptures and how to make it real and applicable, you know, in your hermeneutic and homiletic. But then also in Judaism, we have our own with the drash and the, you know, all the different methodologies that are within the rabbinical way of interpreting it. So I said, man, if they could do it on that side and they could do it on that side, then I could do it in the middle. God, I want one for me. So, is. It is what it is the way it is. And because he's the great I am, is works for me. Because, after all, it is his. <laughs> Too simple? I don't know. I may be a little wiser than you think. He. I may have gotten it from someone. I can't get, I get credit, God. So, item specific in our way of looking at it would be to answer the scripture according to scripture. And you don't answer it according to a scripture you're not looking at, you only answer it according to the scripture you're looking at. So, if we confess our sins, who is we? Now, obviously that's not there, but the we is we. So, you go we, we, we all the way home and you figure out that, you know, you don't want to say we, we too many times because it sounds bad to people listening in the other booth. What? <laughs> not here, go to the restroom. But the point being is we, you could ask that question too, so you make sure that you identify that we is, and then you just use your hand judgment, we, you know, you and me. So it's we, it's always not I, if I confess my sins, no, if we confess our sins. In other words, it incorporates everyone. There is none righteous, no, not one, everyone is sin, fallen short of the glory of God. So if we confess our sins, what should we confess our sins? Who needs to confess? We. You know, you, you reiterate the questions, and you could write that one down if you want to, and write all those down. Um, do we have to? And that's kind of a tricky one. So you always throw one in. You throw two that reiterate the scripture, and then one that makes you think. And do we have to? It says, no, we don't have to, because it says, if we do. If we do this, something will happen. So, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. Who is faithful and just? He is. Or who is faithful? He is. We're not, so you can kind of play that off, you know, learn that. Are you faithful? Well, no, that's why you have to confess your sins, because if you were faithful, then you wouldn't be having to worry about confessing your sins, would you? Or if you were just, you wouldn't have to worry about confessing your sins either, because then you would be just, but you're not, so guess what? He is, you're not. We aren't, guess who? <laughs> he, not me, not we. Pretty simple. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. What is he faithful and just to do? He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Oh, so he, who can forgive sins? You know, now that may be a little tricky one because some of you guys are going to get out there and start quoting scriptures that says, well, if you retain their sins, they'll be retained. If you forgive their sins, they'll be forgiven. You know, and you get into all that. Come, come talk to me sometime. You know, I'll beat you to death with that one. <laughs> you know, I'll get you, you know, no matter who you are theologically. You want to come over my house? Come on, we take three days on that one. Show you where you're going to retain someone's sin. You don't forgive their sins, guess what? <laughs> you won't be forgiven, according to 1 John. It was a trick question when God threw it out there. He ain't supposed to be exercising authority, you know, as though you were the authority and God is. Excuse me. So anyways, getting back to the reality, don't ask that question. <laughs> He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Who forgives? No. He forgives us. That's what we do. He forgives us. And what else does he do? And we go into the next one. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What does he do? 
cleanses cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So you just break it up into the parts, you know, and you ask the questions. You could work on the who, what, we, how, why, us, them, if, ands, or buts, exceptions, reductions, extensions, super <laughs> supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, or you know, the, the in other words, the existential circumstances with which the application works within the dimensionality of the person and the reality of their existence dependent upon their current state and affairs with which God only alone knows. So in some ways, you know, and you could get into all that kind of stuff, but why? We're supposed to be taking some basic believing person that's simple, you know, like my wife, you know, and trying to get them to memorize something so that they could use it in life. Because that's the point that you should be doing with this, using it. If we confess our sins, you would actually sit down if you wanted to be intimate and you were going to disciple this person like I have in the 13 week course called Sunday Schooled, I think. It's either called Bible Taught or Sunday Schooled. I'm not sure, you'd have to look on the video, you know, um, Google video and then you could see there's a bunch of them, you know, and figure out which one it is. Because <laughs> I'm not gonna look it up right now, I'm just like somewhere in there. So, the point being is that when we go through the 13, I think it's Sunday school, now that I think about it, because 13 weeks, and that sounds like a Sunday school lesson, you know, so it's like Sunday school, because Bible taught, I think, is something else. Yeah, Bible taught is on the doctrines and the dogmas of the church, and the, well, yeah, the, the doctrines and dogmas of the church according to the Christian Life Study Outlines that I have in my open Bible. So I'm using that as uh, teaching and relating um, Dogmas and doctrines, basically, of the church. So that's kind of our other series, you know, kind of like, you want to play around with that? Hey, that's what we're doing. <laughs> you know, got to get it out there so everybody knows we're talking the right stuff, you know, saying the same thing, because we've been there, done that, and had to, you know, listen through it too, so that we know that we know what we know, because we really don't know what we think we know, because we only know as much as we thought we knew, but only because we think we know, we have to relate to each other in a way that we think we know each other, because we really don't, because about the time someone falls down, then you realize that they didn't know it quite as well as you thought they knew it, and they didn't do it as much as they thought that they knew it, so instead of doing it the way that they said that they did, they did something that they didn't do, which wasn't the way that they thought that they knew that they would have done if they hadn't known ahead of time that they were going to do what they did. Try that on for size. <laughs> <laughs> that twisted my lips up. But, and that's how twisted they get when they do that. <laughs> but the point is, is that in Sunday school, in the 13 week lesson that we're doing, then you would be intimate with the person. You'd say, are there any sins that you would like to confess? You know, we could pray together and, you know, share one to another. And you could possibly become a disciple at that moment when you start getting real about your sins to say, Look, you know, I'm having a real problem with pornography, you know, I mean, I've been just like, you know, camping out on the internet, you know, and man, every time that I, I, I go on there, you know, it's almost like it's calling my name and I just jump on a website, you know, and there it is, and I just can't resist, you know, it's like, I'm just attracted by the lust of the eye, you know, no, I'm not, it's like, it's a naked woman, you know, <laughs> like, that's interesting, Blech. you know, let's get real, come on now, art, you go to an art museum and see better, I think. When's the last time I've been in a National Art Museum? Oh well. Anyways, when you live around art, you know, and artistic communities and all that kind of stuff where you're a sixties brat, you know, it's not all that attractive. You know, it's kinda of like, well, you know, sometimes wearing clothes is more of a temptation than something wearing no clothes, you know. Because frankly, naked is just naked. That's all it is, you know, and doctors have to deal with it all the time. And nurses and people that cut up bodies and all that kind of junk. It's like, yeah, yeah. Good. So the point is is that when you do confess your sins to one another, as you were using that scripture, then you would, like in that discipleship, only do it if you're willing to invest and commit to that person with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Meaning that you're willing to lay down your life for them, as well as knowing that they may react to you in a adverse way because you're bringing intimacy into something they may not be ready for. So you have to kind of go with the flow of the Holy Spirit and sensitivity, you know, adjustment to where that person is at and what they're ready for. But as you are willing to open up and just lay your cards on the table, such as you are, then they feel more comfortable so that they can, because ye which are spiritual ought to bear the infirmities of those who are not. So you begin to take that undergirding role of being a servant underneath them. You come under them, not over them. <laughs> 
you don't stand on top of their head and start beating on them and telling them what they did wrong. You know? They start telling you what kind of sin they're in, you don't go tell them how to fix it. <laughs> you confess it. That's it. It doesn't say to fix it. It says just confess it. That's it. You don't go working on it. That's God's department. Then, if they ask you something, you pray about it. You always let God lead according to what He says, not according to what you think. You know, no, eh, wrong. So, number two, we're done. You know, that's beginning with Christ. That's how we do it. This is how we do it, do it. This is how we do it, do it. This is how we do it, do it. Or that's how you'll do it, because if you will commit yourself to sharing those five scriptures that we are doing, you know, and realizing that God is the one who's working to cause that person to memorize, to apply, to invest in their soul and mind that beginning with Jesus kind of attitude, then they're going to be assured that they will move in the right direction, that they can walk down the path without tripping over their own feet without stumbling over someone else's legs that are stuck out there like an old Christian will do. You know, just trip them up, see if they can make them fall. You know, or like some cynic will do in order to try to see if they're even really a Christian. But rather, it begins to ingratiate them in the love and the caring aspect of what God wants to do with that person's life. Because you have taken the time outside of your schedule to care for that person. Because you should never do this if it's a class. If it's just a class to you, get out of it. This is spiritual truth and reality. This is the fact of what Jesus said. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The very words you are saying are life. It is Jesus. And as much as you're treating that person with respect, care, loving, honor, and cherishing that person to bring them into the body and blood of Jesus Christ and the family and becoming one with you as a brother and sister, then you are treating Jesus the same way. And as much as you've done it to Him, that person... You've done it unto Jesus, the Son of God. And so as you share in a caring way, you're really kind of like just taking Jesus and wrapping your arms around him. Because Jesus is in that person. And you just got a chance to talk to him in real life. Isn't that cool? Go out and do it, man. Just kind of like, you know, if you're a rapper and a trapper and a japper and you know whatever you're going to do, you know, if you're going to do your thing, bring it. <laughs> or if you're going to check it, check it. <laughs> or if you're just going to share it, just share it, you know. I mean, you're just going to have fun with it. And that's the main and most important thing to remember in those five scriptures. Have fun with it. That person just got saved. You're rejoicing still over the birth of a baby Christian. Five weeks is still plenty of time to just be happy that that baby is still just rolling around and not waking up in the middle of the night, not pooping her pants, not peeing the diaper, not yelling and screaming and wanting to be fed. But it's five weeks of just loving on them and let them enjoy the fact that they just got saved and they entered into something they have no clue what the heck they just did. <laughs> so rejoice with them and be glad. For this is the day that God saved them. And he is confirming that salvation in this process. That it would not be just seed that fell on bad ground. Or seed that fell on the pavement. Or seed that fell someplace where it wouldn't germinate. And become a planting of the Lord. And because you've done that, O gardener. Then God will bless you and cause fruit to grow in your life.